Greetings to all of you, scattered throughout every corner of this spinning little ball. Today, we embark on a journey into the very fabric of time, a journey that transcends cultures, religions, and epochs. Today, we delve into the journey of salvation and the profound call to work it out with fear and trembling. If there has been and is something excellent throughout the ages, it is salvation. If there is nothing more necessary, it is working for salvation. If there is any tool to work with, it is nothing but holy fear. Work out your own salvation with fear, wrote Paul to the Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. The words are a grave and serious exhortation, needful not only for those Christians who lived in the Apostles' time, but may fitly be calculated for the era in which we live. I proceed now to the exhortation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Which words do branch themselves into these three particulars? First, the act work out. Secondly, the object your own salvation. Thirdly, the manner in which we should work it out with fear and trembling. I shall speak principally of the first two and draw in the other briefly in the application. The proposition is this, it should be a Christian's great work to be working out his salvation. The great God hath put us into the world as into a vineyard, and here is the work he hath set us about, the working out of salvation. There is a parallel scripture to this, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. When estate, friends, life cannot be made sure, let this be made sure. The original Greek signifies to study or contemplate about a thing. These words in the text, work out, imply two things. First, a shaking off spiritual sloth. Sloth is a pillow on which many have slept the sleep of death. Secondly, it implies a uniting and rallying together all, the powers of our souls, that we may attend the business of salvation. God had enacted a law in paradise that no man should eat of the tree of life, but only in the sweat of his brows. I will not proceed now to the reasons enforcing this holy sweat and industry about salvation, and they are three. We must not work out our salvation because of the difficulty of this work, the rarity of it, the possibility of it, the difficulty of this work. It is a task that may make us labor to the going down of the sun of our life. Now this difficulty about the work of salvation will appear in four manners of ways. First, from the nature of the work, the heart is to be changed. The heart is the very nursery of sin. It is the magazine where all the weapons of unrighteousness are. It is a lesser hell. The heart is full of antipathy against God. It is angry with converting grace. Now that the bias of the heart should be changed, what a task is this? How should we ask of Christ that he who turned the water into wine would turn the water, or rather poison of nature, into the wine of grace? The heart will be ready to deceive us in this work of salvation and make us take a show of grace for grace. Many think they repent when it is not the offence, but the penalty which troubles them, not the treason, but the bloody axe. They think they repent when they shed a few tears, but though this ice begins to melt a little, it freezes again. They go on still in sin. Many weep for their unkind dealings with God, as Saul did for his unkindness to David. He said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. But for all this he follows David again and pursues after him. Secondly, so men can lift up their voices and weep for sin, yet follow their sins again. Thirdly, others forsake sin, but still they retain the love of it in their hearts. Like the snake that sheds the coat but keeps the sting, there is as much difference between false and true tears as between channel water and spring water. That which makes salvation work hard is that it is a slippery task. 
look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought. This work falls down almost as fast as we build. An ordinary artisan, when he's been at work, finds his work the next morning, just as he left it. But it is not so with us. When we have been working out salvation by prayer, fasting, meditation, and leave this work a while, we shall not find our work as we left it. A great deal of our work has fallen down again. We had need be often called upon to strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. No sooner is a Christian taken off from the fire of the sanctuary, but he's ready to cool and freeze again in security. He is like a watch when he has been wound up towards heaven. He does quickly unwind to earth and sin again. When the gold has been purified in the furnace, it remains pure, but it is not so with the heart. Let it be heated in an ordinance. Let it be purged in the furnace of affliction. It does not remain pure, but quickly gathers soil and corruption. We are seldom long in a good frame. All this shows how difficult the work of salvation is. We must not only work, but set a watch too. Question, but why has God made the way to heaven so hard? Why must there be this working? Answer to make us set a high estimate upon heavenly things. If salvation were easily come by, we should not have valued it to its worth. If diamonds were ordinary, they would be slighted, but because they are hard to come by, they are in great esteem. 2. The rarity of this work, the second reason we must put forth so much holy sweat and industry about salvation, is because of the rarity of this work but few shall be saved. Therefore, we had need work harder that we may be in the number of these few. The way to hell is a broad way. The causeway of it is paved with riches and pleasure. It has a golden causeway. Therefore, there are daily so many travelers in it, but the way to heaven lies out of the road. It is an unbeaten path, and few can find it. Those who advocate universal grace say that Christ died intentionally for all. But then why are not all saved? Can Christ be frustrated of his intention? Some are so gross to a veer that all shall actually be saved. But has not our Lord Christ told us, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. How all can go in at this gate, and yet but few find it, seems to me a contradiction. 3. The possibility of this work. The third reason why we should put forth so much vigor about the work of salvation is because of the possibility of the work. Impossibility kills all endeavor. Who will take pains for that which he thinks there is no hope of ever obtaining? But there is hope in Israel concerning this. Salvation is a thing feasible. It may be had. O oh, Christians, though the gate of paradise be straight, yet the gate is open. It is shut against the devils, but it is yet open to you. Who would not crowd hard to get in? It is but paring off your sins. It is but unloading some of your thick clay. It is but assuaging the swelling humor of your pride, and you may get in at the straight gate. This possibility, nay probability of salvation, may put life into your endeavor. If there be corn to be had, why should you sit starving in your sins any longer? And so I proceed to the use of exhortation to persuade you all in the bowels of Christ to set about this great work, the working out your salvation. Beloved, here is a plot for heaven, and I would have you all in this plot. Rally together all the powers of your souls. Give neither God nor yourselves rest till you have made your election sure. Christians, fall to work. Do it early earnestly, incessantly, pursue salvation as in a holy chase. Other things are but matters of convenience. Salvation is a matter of necessity. You must either do the work that Christians are doing, or you must do the work that devils are doing. Oh, you that never yet took one stitch in this work of salvation, begin now. Religion is a good trade if it be well followed. 
Be assured, there is no salvation without working. But here I must lay down a caution to prevent mistakes. Though we shall not be saved without working, yet not for our working. We do not work out salvation by way of merit. Bellarmine says we merit heaven out of worthiness. No, though we are saved in the use of means, yet by grace too, there must be ploughing and sowing the ground, but yet no crop can be expected without the influence of the sun. So there must be working, but no crop of salvation can be hoped for without the sunshine of free grace. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Give. Why might some say we have wrought hard for it, I? But heaven is a donative, though you work for it. Yet it is the good pleasure of God to bestow it. Still look up to Christ's merit. It is not your sweat, but his blood that saves. That your working cannot merit salvation is clear. It is God that works in you to will and to do. It is not your working, but God's co-working. For as the Scrivener guides the child's hand, or he cannot write, so the Spirit of God must afford his auxiliary concurrence, or our work stands still. How then can any man merit by working when it is God that helps him to work? I shall now, having laid down this caution, resume the exhortation and pursued you to the working out salvation. But I must first remove two objections which lie in the way. In conclusion, let us embrace the profound truth that salvation, the celestial gift of everlasting life, is not earned through the sweat of our labor, but is graciously bestowed by the good pleasure of God. As we navigate the intricate journey of working out our salvation, may we fix our gaze upon Christ's merit, acknowledging that His blood, not our toil, is the saving force. Remember, it is God who works in us, guiding our efforts just as a scrivener guides a child's hand. In humility, let us recognize the divine co-working that propels our pursuit of salvation. As we part ways for now, I invite you to stay tuned for the next video, where we will delve into two common objections that may arise on this sacred path. Together let us continue this journey of reflection, understanding and shared pursuit of the divine. May the grace of God accompany you on your quest for salvation. Don't forget to like, subscribe to Bible Bite for more bite-sized revelations and deep dives into the timeless truths of Scripture. And hit the notification bell so you won't miss a single bite of wisdom. As always, share your thoughts and theories in the comments because in Bible Bite, every comment is a piece of the divine puzzle. Until next time, may the word illuminate your path.